Perfect. It's 3.20 now, according to my watch. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so things look a little bit different today, and that's because I have a guest speaker today, Cyrus Hall, who's uh, formerly of Twitch and AWS. And he's going to be giving a guest lecture today about heterogeneous distributed systems. And I'm very excited to welcome Cyrus. And so, uh, Cyrus, let's uh, share your presentation. You bet. And uh, I think I'll drop myself off, if that's OK. Uh -huh. um, and I'll, I may pop back on uh, if I have questions or if we have stuff to discuss. Um, yeah, actually, um, yeah, I'll pop off for now and then uh, maybe join in later. Um, but let's welcome Cyrus. Take it away, Cyrus. Awesome. Um, thank you very much. So uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Patrick um, for egging me on uh, for a solid week to do this. Uh, it's a pleasure to do it. Uh, and thank you uh, to everyone for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something uh, I'm entitling for this talk, heterogeneous distributed systems. Um, and a little bit about me before we get going. So I'm a former academic who uh, left academia after seeing my future being 10 years of postdocing. Uh, but before then, I got my master's at CU Boulder uh, working on uh, sensor networks. And I also got a PhD at the University of Lugano in Switzerland on peer-to-peer -peer networks. And a couple fun facts sort of related to this presentation. My master's advisor was uh, the University of California Santa Cruz Dean of Engineering, Alex Wolf. Um, when he ran a lab at University of Colorado. And fun fact too, I actually climbed uh, a mountain in Switzerland with Leslie Lamport. So uh, just sort of random, not really related facts. Over the last nine years, uh, I, I spent time, all of my time really, at Twitch uh, and then Amazon Web Services, uh, leaving uh, August of last year. Uh, during that period, I architect, built, and managed significant portions of the video system at Twitch, uh, particularly uh, what was called the video replication system, which is the system that if you're watching on Twitch is uh, taking the video from the origin of the video system and making sure it can uh, make it to your computer smoothly uh, and with low latency. Uh, more recently, I'm doing some advising and consulting, but also just taking some time off. So this talk, this talk has three parts. Uh, first, we're going to define what is a heterogeneous distributed system. Uh, then we're going to talk about how do these systems develop. Uh, the way in which these systems uh, develop, i.e. sort of get built up piece by piece over time, um, is really important understanding why they're so hard to deal with and they're so hard to build and manage. And then we're going to go through a few principles of uh, building onto and managing a heterogeneous distributed system, and some rules of thumb. So if there's three things I'd like you to take away from this talk, if you fall asleep after this slide, they're the following. Heterogeneous systems are the natural outcome of complex products. Products in this talk refer to features on a website, or a website itself, or maybe um, a complex desktop app that has backends associated with it. So products are the application. Products have diverse features. They're not just rendering a static web page. You can buy things on them. You can chat on them. Um, you can configure them to display content. You can put in your personal information. And this makes composing them inherently difficult. We're composing multiple very different pieces of functionality together. And I also just want to note that products that are aimed at humans, that humans consume, have more diverse concerns and sometimes entirely different priorities than distributed systems that are focused on very narrow computational concerns. So let's start with part one. What is a heterogeneous distributed system? Um, and so we're going to talk about something uh, I've, I've called first order distributed systems and how they compose into heterogeneous distributed systems. And then we'll go through a brief 
web scale example. So let's start with classic distributed systems. A distributed system is multiple processes working together towards some sort of common goal. They're distributed because they don't share memory space. Uh, they're all operating in separate processes, maybe on the same machine, probably on different machines. Often they use some sort of a concept of time and ordering, you know, i.e. vector clocks, and they make acceptance decisions. So can I accept this message? Does this decision have consensus? Uh, sort of acceptance is often the backbone of the conceptualization of a distributed system. They tend to work well when service semantics are focused and when we're in a controlled environment. So we're doing one thing, typically with strong guarantees, but we struggle to scale to wide area networks. And so this led to more extreme, if you will, distributed systems, things like peer-to-peer -peer networks and sensor nets, the sorts of networks I worked on uh, back when I was an academic. There's still multiple processes working together towards a common goal. A good example of this is uh, the border gateway protocol. This is the protocol that manages uh, the routing table of the internet. Um, and in general, routing and forwarding algorithms are classic distributed systems. They often are eventually consistent, where eventual in this case actually means likely to never pass. Um, there is no globally consistent view of the internet routing table. It doesn't exist. Why? Because routes take time to propagate. And the rate at which routes change is so fast that BGP can never catch up. And that's OK for these more widely distributed, uh, distributed systems. Decisions in these more extreme systems are often made in a greedy manner. And I mean that in an algorithmic sense. They're greedy algorithms that are designed to lead to eventual global consistency if changes to the system stop. Of course, changes to the system don't stop. So you never actually reach that global consistency, and that's OK. But these are still related to your classic distributed systems. Fundamentally, the processes are all focused on a common computational goal and use a common algorithm. We don't have multiple systems that are that have different goals that are using different algorithms talking to each other. These are systems with the same goal, same algorithm. So I'm going to talk or refer to those kind, those kinds of systems we just talked about as first order systems. They have a single purpose, there's no common memory space, and they all run the same algorithm. And when I say same algorithm, of course, uh, there are different components to an algorithm. So if you're running Paxis, there may be an, a, a leader, right? That leader is going to perform different actions than the other members of the distributed system, but it's still the same algorithm. It's part of the definition of the algorithm. And there's lots of examples of these first order systems. You have your classic consensus and replication, so Paxos, Raft, Google File System, and S3, DynamoDB, which I hear you just read about. Um, but also some relational database systems fall into this too. If you have relational database systems that have replicas, that are active. This is a distributed system. Networking, things like routing protocols, BGP and RIP, overlay networks like Tor, uh, which is an onion router, and reliability protocols. I would argue that TCP is a distributed system. It's a bit of a weird one, but it's multiple processes, common goal. It uses uh, effectively uses timestamps. Um, and there's cooperation, albeit implicit, between multiple TCP connections in order to manage a segment of the network. Also P2P, things like distributed hash tables, gossip, and BitTor. So a heterogeneous distributed system is composed of more than one first order system. And importantly, they may be distributed systems or they may be non-distributed systems. So I toyed with calling the second order, but I threw that out because realistically, these aren't just made up of distributed systems. They're going to have a lot of distributed components, but then they're also going to have non-replicated databases sitting in them. They're going to have single points of failure that are load balancers. 
So they're more complex than just a collection of distributed systems. And a heterogeneous system's behavior is determined by the behavior of the first order components, but also the manner in which they are composed. So by composing these things together, we're changing the, the, the behavior that the system is going to express. And I'll note that composition of components is primarily a human task. That should always be scary to us uh, because humans aren't very good at doing things right. And we'll see a lot of that later in the talk. Interactions between systems tend to lead to complex failure modes. And so that is really the core uh, problem one is trying to solve when working with heterogeneous distributed systems. So a quick example uh, to sort of try to just uh, drive the definitions home. Um, here's your average web startup on the very first day. Founder has an idea. Um, they want to build a website for it. They download a, a web generation framework. They read the first two lines of documentation. They type in a name. They hit return. It generates 10,000 lines of code. They hit run. And what they've done is they've generated an HTTP API, probably connected to a database of some sort on the back end, typically something like Postgres or MySQL. I'm going to use data store just to be generic. Maybe this is a progressive web founder and they're using like a NoSQL, you know, uh, database of some sort. So uh, we have a distributed system, right? A website doesn't just run a single process for its HTTP server. There's multiple processes. They're running the same code. They have the same purpose. They're basically a distributed system. It's not as fancy or cool as Paxis, but it's a, it's a distributed system. And then we have a maybe distributed system number two, the data store, and together we have a heterogeneous system. So um, that's, that's what we're talking about. So it's important to talk about how diverse systems can be. They tend to differ in a large subset of properties. They have different purpose and goals, but they also have different frameworks. They're using different languages. They may not all be talking the same API. At Twitch, in the video system, we had systems that talked BGP, that talked uh, Google Protobuf, that talked HTTP, um, that talked something called Twerp, which was a Twitch special sauce uh, interface protocol. Um, so lots of diversity. Service discovery frameworks might be different. Some services might be named of DNS. Some services you may need to, need to call the service discovery framework in order to get a reference to the service. So composing these things together is inherently hard. They may not exist in the same network location. In a classic distributed system, you're running in the same data center. You're not running Paxos wide area. Um, in a heterogeneous system, you have possibly classic distributed systems, but they're going to be distributed in different locations. And now you have to bind them together in a useful way. And you have configuration. Even if you have multiple instances of the same system, often they're configured differently. And that configuration leads to differences in behavior. So you can't even think of them as the same. So each of these systems expresses failure and error states and correctness differently. And that means hard to compose. So even if our simple system that we looked at, where we really have really three components, we have a user making requests, we have an HTTP API, and we have a data store, it looks simple, but it's already complex. The API likely does many different things. It's not just, doesn't just have one function, it's rendering an admin page, and it's rendering the front page, and it's rendering the, the channel page. The consistency of the data store doesn't actually guarantee consistency of experience for the client. Um, the HTTP API can get in the way. The client can get in the way. There could be in-memory caching. There could be look-aside caches. The data store has limited capacity. We have all these different API calls that are making different uses of that capacity this is going to become a problem. Uh, and finally, there's the client. There's uncontrolled code, and that means users can provide erroneous input to the system. So with that, I want to pause 
Um, and I want to ask if there's any questions. I'm going to take a sip of water and uh, scroll down to Zulip. Great. So it looks like there was one. Yeah, it looks like there was one okay. question already. Sounds good. What are failure modes? Um, sorry, I should have said at the beginning, you can absolutely ask questions at any time. I may just not see them until uh, I pause and take a look. What are failure modes? OK, that's a great question. I didn't really define that, did I? Um, so a failure mode is when a system uh, exhibits some form of failure. So for example, uh, a system that's under high load could have a failure mode where some percentage of requests start to return errors. Or it could have a failure mode where it just collapses and uh, explodes, uh, i.e., uh, the process exits, runs out of memory, runs out of sockets, maybe, uh, on the system. So failure mode is a generic way of saying uh, a system fails with some sort of behavior. So the thing that struck me, uh, Cyrus, as you were mm -hmm. talking about uh, heterogeneous distributed systems and introducing what that uh, that term means, is that so. I'm I'm somebody who works on verification, and so often we find with verified software that you might verify individual components, but bugs still come up at the interfaces between components. Yeah. And so, so much of the time. Uh, somebody will be working with this supposedly verified software and still finding that there are bugs at those interfaces. And that problem is exacerbated the more of these individual components you have. So of course, that's the first thing that I thought of when I, yeah. when I saw your slide. And I think there's a really great paper from Google called Paxos Made Live, uh, which mm. this also made me think of, which is about their experience deploying Paxos as part of um, as part of the Chubby Lock service. And um, you know, Paxos is one thing, but actually having it as a component as part of this larger system is quite another. And so, you know, in this class we study Paxos, right? But then actually deploying it in this context uh, and uh, taking into account the complexity of the surrounding system uh, makes everything harder. And I'm really excited that that is what you're talking with mm -hmm. us about today. Yeah. yeah, so I can actually give a, a quick example of that from, uh, from Twitch, where we ended up deploying Raft um, in a bunch of our data centers. Uh, at one point in order to store uh, data center um, local information. And uh, we were we were very excited. This information had previously been stored in a central database that was not replicated, was a single point of failure, and had failed uh, previously. And so the data was cached everywhere. Like the, con the consistency or, or correctness of that caching was questionable. Um, and so now we were going to have definitive answers when we needed them as to what the appropriate uh, configuration was. And uh, the system that was going to manage that information was going to be uh, highly uh, reliable via redundancy. Um, so this was exciting. And what we found was, one, uh, because we only had a single raft instance, and by instance, I mean a set of machines participating in the Raft protocol, uh, and that multiple teams immediately wanted to use the service, uh, it was very difficult to control load on Raft. And so we started having too many people try to do consistent reads, uh, and then Raft would get overloaded and get slow, and you start getting errors out of it because like, you'd get latency timeouts. And the other thing we discovered is that <laughs> we still needed caching. It didn't actually solve the caching problem. Um, because uh, just because something is more reliable doesn't mean it's always there. And so you still need to be ready for failure. And a lot of our problems in deployment of that system ended up being in making sure the caching was correct, not in using basic raft. So yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to check questions again really quick here. Oh, Zach already knows what we're actually talking about. We're actually talking about microservices versus the monolith. This is true. So part two, um, how do these systems develop? Um, and the subtitle here, and I'm going to explain the monolith in just a second. The monolith decays and gives life to many services from its ashes. Reality keeps getting in the way. So let's go back to your average web. I just made that up. It's not a quote. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so back to your average web startup. Um, just these these two uh, uh, services again. Sorry, wrong word. Systems. Um, this is classically called the monolith. And I don't totally know who originated this. Um, but this is a term you're going to hear in industry. Oh, we have a monolithic stack. What does that mean? It means all of their API calls are shoved into a single um, system that serves all sorts of different purposes and probably talks to a single data store. This is where most people start. Um, but the reality is if we look inside that HTTP API, there's actually a bunch of different components. It's not just an HTTP API. It's a web front end API. It's probably an admin API. Maybe there's a daily aggregation API that does long running aggregation tasks on the data store of some sort. And these different APIs have different properties to them. The front end API, it's largely online. It has very low latency requirements. A user makes a request, a user needs to get information back. The daily aggregation tasks, they're mostly actually offline. High latency is OK. They often take a lot of memory. So running the daily aggregation tasks actually bloats the API uh, in terms of memory utilization. It may have a really heavy load on the data back end. And then the admin is usually an awkward mix of, of these sorts of things. So we can recursively um, sort of apply what we, we did with the basic service and start breaking the HTTP API into multiple services that better reflect the different modalities of use. So here's one suggestion at a better design. We could have a front end API, an admin API, and an offline, offline API all talking to the data store. We'll throw a load balancer in front of it. At this point, I'll talk briefly about load balancers. Why do we have load balancers? Each one of these APIs is really n instances of a process, probably running on different machines, hopefully. And the client needs to have a consistent thing to address. That consistent thing is the load balancer. And then the load balancer also often does failure detection. So if one of our instances in the API fleet goes down, the load balancer's role is to detect that, usually just by some sort of ping mechanism, and to take it out of rotation such that users don't get errors. Our users talk to the load balancer, and our offline scripts talk to the load balancer. So what problems do people see with this? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to brain dump in chat. I have some thoughts, but first I want to see what other folks in the class uh, might say. Well, there was a question actually about uh, what are some examples of daily aggregation tasks? Yeah, so I can talk about that while people are, are thinking. So a daily aggregation task is something that uh, usually gets run for business operations. So your business operations folks are going to want to know things like uh, how many transa sales transactions did we have today? How many items were purchased? How many people came to the site? Um, how long was their length of stay? Uh, you know, the, these are important metrics for the business. They tell you if things are getting going well, are they going poorly? Do we need to make changes? Uh, and in small sites, these are often roll-up metrics where there's a trace of transactions that are made, and then there's some sort of summary that goes through that trace, sums it all up, and makes some summary statistics. Um, 
yeah, so let's see. So we're getting some replies here. Uh, so Julian says, single centralized data store and load balancer. Yes, absolutely. Timothy says, what if the load balancer is under too much load? Yeah, I, I, this is sort of a nice uh, subclass. It's a failure mode of the centralized load balancer. Uh, let's say the uh, offline scripts are making a whole bunch of rapid fire requests all at once on the load balancer. They may deny uh, requests from users. The opposite could be true as well. Maybe there's a massive user spike suddenly and the offline system is airing. Cyrus, um, if I could interrupt oh, for one second, yes. it looks like um, the slides are no longer showing up on the stream for some oh, reason. Oh, no. OK. Oh, now I see them on stream again. So suddenly it disappeared, and, but now it's, now it's back. OK, let me go back into full screen again. Oops, not share. I don't want to share. Uh, are we good? It looks good now. OK. Weird. I don't know what happened there. Um, Oops, uh, what is it, it seems to have disappeared again. Oh, it could be because I'm not in that virtual. Yeah, it's when I scroll away. Oh, I'm no. Sorry. I'm in Linux, and I'm trying to be cool for you know virtual desktops and stuff, and uh, it's not working. So let me move, let me move Zulip up to the same screen. It might flash again for a second, but okay. it should be back. Okay. Um. So uh, let's see here. So someone had another one. So Zach said, "What, uh, what if uh, the API goes down and the lo load balancer has nowhere to route to?" Um, that's a that's a good one. So one of the reasons we want to run multiple instances of each API on different machines is to try to avoid the situation where we have no instances of a particular API that can still serve requests. Um, of course, that can still happen. Uh, you know, and if that happens, yeah, we're out of luck. Um, we we needed to be running more, or maybe we weren't alerting and paying attention to errors that were coming up. Um, that can definitely also be a problem. So yeah, let's go through. Uh, let's go through these. Let's start in the back end. So uh, I think everyone probably saw that the data store is a single point of failure for all the APIs. So this is really bad. Uh, if we lose the data store, we lose all our APIs. We don't actually have resiliency here. And we still have this issue of variable request patterns where we're still applying very short, low latency requests from the front end. And the offline API could still be locking tables for long periods of time as it's running rollups at the end of the day. We're still vulnerable to spiky traffic patterns. If there's suddenly a viral event, and this happened at Twitch all the time. There'd be a sudden viral event that no one was expecting. And rather than having, say, 10,000 people load video in a minute, we'd have a million people load video in a minute. That's a spiky traffic pattern. Um, and so spiky traffic patterns, you know, it's not just going to just take down the front end API. It's going to take down the data store with it. I also want to note that resource management in this kind of system is distributed. The front end API. The other APIs, they're each managing their request rate to the data store. So if they're trying not to trample on each other, they're going to have to know about each other's requests, or they're going to have to know about each other's patterns. Well, now we've got strong coupling again. We want to avoid that kind of hard coupling between um, uh, services. Maybe we could manage that in the API, or sorry, in the data store layer. And, and that can work. We could have a different user for each API, and then we could have a number of outstanding requests. But fundamentally, most data stores can't rate limit based on the complexity of the query. They can only rate limit based on the number of requests. So a, a bad request that locks a table, for example, could still come in and do damage. So that style of management tends to fail as the number of services grow. In the front end, most of you, again, you saw that the load balancer is a single point of failure. Um, but we also have the same sorts of load issues with the load balancer as well. I also want to bring up briefly privacy and security concerns. 
this is actually worth multiple lectures of time, and I'm not going to talk about it for the rest of the lecture, but I do just want to mention it really quickly. A lot of heterogeneous systems have caches all over the place. Sometimes load balancers cache. But in general, one of the, the issues of heterogeneous systems is because data gets cached all over, trying to hedge against other systems failing, we're storing user data all over the place. And this brings up privacy and security concerns. Are there ways that a malicious actor can get at that data? And it's best to separate these concerns. So in this case, the load balancer, if it is caching things, could be caching the results of the offline scripts. If those were to somehow become available publicly, that could be really bad for the business. It could show that the business isn't doing well. It could expose private user data about what they purchased. It could have all sorts of things in there that we don't want exposed. So this is one of these concerns that while it exists in classical systems, privacy, I think is a much more upfront concern in heterogeneous systems. So let's condense these concerns. Really what we're talking about here are availability and resiliency, where availability is the percentage of a time that a system responds. It's a very simple measurement. Often, well, <laughs> simple in theory. Uh, often this is called a number of nines. So you'll probably hear five nines is 99.999% of a time uh, a system is available. Most companies are pretty happy if they're somewhere between three and four nines, honestly. And a lot of startups are happy if they're hitting 98% availability, like isn't a bad place to be. Um, typically, the more mature a product, the higher the desire for high availability becomes. And then there's resilience. It sounds really similar, and it is pretty close. Resilience is the ability of a system to remain available. So a low resilient, resilient system struggles, a high resilient system um, has a lot of mechanisms to remain available. And resiliency is the product of a lot of factors, but there are some key elements. One is how isolated from failure can I make a system? Can I isolate my availability from my dependencies failing? Can I isolate myself from my requesters having issues, either sending me too much traffic um, or having other failures. Uh, redundancy and ease of scalability. A redundant system that has multiple instances or has backup copies is more likely to remain available. And it also tends to mean it's easier to scale. If I'm suddenly seeing quick growth on a service, if I can't scale the service, I'm going to have availability issues. If I can scale the service, I'm going to uh, probably avoid the availability issues. And then load management. I'm going to talk about this uh, more in the example section. But being available may not mean a service is actually properly functioning. And this is important. Um, measures of availability often are no more than, did I get a 200 HTTP response, a, a uh, success response, effectively? when I made a generic request, yes or no. It doesn't mean that the data contained within that request was correct. Maybe it returned junk. Maybe it 200 and then didn't return anything. This has concerning implications for failure detection. It means that things like our load balancers that are using fairly simple mechanisms may not detect a failure. This means failing hard can actually be important rather than failing soft, right? Completely failing, being completely inaccessible can be a better failure state if you cannot ensure proper functioning under a partial failure than being in a partial failure state where you're returning bad data. So let's go to a second iteration. And we're getting close to a break. I know there's a 10 minute break coming up, so we're almost there. But let's quickly go through a second iteration of the basic website where we've separated out the APIs, we've separated out our load balancers, we've even replicated the data store, and now the offline API uses the replica rather than the main data store. So it should have less ability to impact us, although database replication is a bit weird, uh, and that's not always true. And 
even better if the replica, if the main data store fails, we could even just move into a read-only mode with the replica for a period of time until we can restore um, the primary uh, data store. So this seems better, right? Oh, yeah, or we could just use DynamoDB and not worry about all this stuff. I recommend that, but most, most startups don't do that. Um, so this seems better. And what we're seeing is a recursive service pattern where if we look at our web front end API, we're also going to find feature one and a bunch of different features there that we might also want to split out. For example, if we have an API that's both hosting, say, a checkout API to purchase items and is also hosting a page render API, one of those is more important than the other from a product perspective. I want to make sure my website is up and rendering pages more than I actually care about the ability to check out. Doesn't matter if I can't render pages. It doesn't matter if I can check out or not. Um, so we naturally end up splitting individual features and products out as they grow in importance and as new features are added. With maturity in companies, you eventually just start building new features as new services from the get-go. And really quick, I've been using service and system a bit. And they both start with S, and they both sound really similar. So I want to take a second, and I want to just uh, try to, try to uh, separate them out here. So a system is what we've been talking about as a distributed system. It's a set of processes that implements a single technical function. A service is a collection of systems, distributed or not, that implements a product function. So a chat service implements a chat feature, and it consists of systems that implement proxies, API, some sort of data bus between um, chat nodes, etc. So applying that to our second iteration, we really have three services here. We have a front end service, an admin service, and an offline service. And those services consist of the load balancer, the API, and whatever data stores we're using directly. So with that, it's break time. It's quiz time. Uh, I guess before we do that, let me check the questions. There is Zulip. Um, oh no, were we having issues on Twitch as well? Only uh, only minor issues with okay. um, with the uh, um, the uh, some of the slides we're not showing momentarily, but I think you got it sorted out. So, so yeah, let's go through some questions really quick, and then we can do um, the quiz. Yeah, sounds um, good. Why only two hundred? Okay, shouldn't other two hundred status codes also be acceptable? Absolutely. Uh, that being said. Most failure detection, uh, and I hope people don't laugh too much at this, but most failure detection that is actually performed uh, is as simple as calling a synthetic HTTP endpoint, often entitled something like alive um, or OK, that doesn't return any data and performs no operations and simply just echoes 200. That mm -hmm. is. I'm not going to call it the gold standard because it's not, but it is the the normal behavior of most uh, failure detection systems. Um, Ike says it might be useful to distinguish between hardware and software failures. Uh, I I totally agree. Um, I wasn't going to dig into that to this talk, uh, but there's there's a lot of nuance. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, there's a lot of nuance there. Um, hardware failures, well, there's all different types, right? I mean, that's part of why hardware failure is so hard to talk about. There's mm -hmm. your easy hardware failure, which is your power supply dies and the machine turns off. That's an awesome sort of failure because it's it's really definitive, right? It's like it's down and nothing responds. But then you have really annoying hardware failures, like one of your memory dim dies, 
But Linux is awesome, and it just keeps running mostly, except not entirely, and there's some really weird memory corruption errors. Or your hard drive or SSD dies, um, and you're actually, uh, or it doesn't die die, but like partially dies, and you start getting file system corruption, and it's creeping, and you don't really notice it for two months, and it's your database machine. Those kind of errors are really unfortunate, uh, and it's why you create backups for things like data stores. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's better to be resilient to failure than to try to special case failure, uh, and that's a fine, that's like a really delicate line, and I guess a difficult statement to parse. Um, but be prepared to recover from failure rather than trying to manage it, if that makes sense. So if you discover your database is corrupted, that's OK, because you have a backup that's recent, uh, or you were using. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think a lot of the hardware, the slowly bubbling hardware failures um, don't tend to become a concern of, maybe they should, um, of system, well, of distributed system engineers. They tend to be more of a concern of system operators and system engineers who are monitoring for failure as well as they can, and who are advising the distributed systems engineers on how to make sure they are prepared for data corruption and, and other, other sorts of phenomena. So I think if you're prepared for data corruption, then where that data corruption comes from is a little less important, right? If it's coming from software injecting bad data or if it's coming from ECC errors injecting bad data, uh, but yeah, it's a difficult question. I, I think you have to talk specifics when it comes to hardware. Um, are there common methods of soft failure detection regarding the actual data returned? Not that I'm aware of. Um, there could be. I'm not aware of them. I haven't seen them used uh, in general. There are statistical uh, failure detection methods that might look at very specific types of return values and check them against a known good distribution. Um, but that has limited applicability and can be difficult to, to really um, set up correctly. So an example of that would be, let's say I want to monitor if an HTTP endpoint that renders a particular page is returning good data. I could monitor the length of the return data. So if I have a bunch of good returns and I, I look at that statistical distribution, um, I can then use that as a model for what good is and apply that to, to future uh, returns. That works great, of course, unless the page changes. And often the binding between the people who are building the distributed system and the people who are uh, designing the look and feel of the web page and what components are on it. Uh, maybe they switch frameworks and it just like bloats the HTML or they really reduce it because they're working on latency. Um, having that communication ahead of time and then like rebuilding that model so it doesn't alert and suddenly detect an error when there isn't one, that gets really complex and hard. That's a really good point. And yeah, I, I think your your point about how if you have a false positive, that can get really tiresome really fast, especially if somebody is getting paged as a result of yeah. that. And then you get into problems with um, those pages being ignored, right? 
if yes. they alert too often when there's not actually a problem. So then you have a boy who cried wolf situation. So you, yeah. you so the, I, there's a there's a technical term for that. Uh, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, I think it's called uh, alert fatigue. Um, so um, and it's a real uh, serious uh, HCI issue in the design of these systems. So it's something that you have to watch out for. Yeah, having been on call for years and years and years at Twitch, I can attest that alert fatigue is very real. And uh, if he's on the line, let's hear it. Um, yeah, he still is alert fatigue. I mean, Patrick will remember conversations we had on the team about which alerts to turn off. And I distinctly remember Patrick saying, this is a useless alert. It alerts too much. I hate it. I want mm -hmm. this alert to die. He didn't probably <laughs> use that word. but And I probably said something like, yes, but occasionally it's right, <laughs> which is the wrong response, right? Like that's, I don't remember. I just, I, I, I just remember having these conversations with you and the rest of the team, right? Around some of our noisier uh, alerts. So to give a clear example, uh, the the team um, that uh, I managed, that Patrick was on, was responsible for all of our edge servers across the world. Um, we managed all the HTTP servers, all the caching, all the intermediary caches, um, all the configuration, um, and all the the services that that ran as sidecars to those those HTTP servers. And we had liveness alerts that did the thing. Uh, a little bit better than the, the the generic response. They they got a random manifest for a stream on Twitch, and they tried to play it back. Um, sometimes streams just have weird difficulties where the inbound stream has errors, and the transcoder struggles to transcode that stream into multiple renditions or even to segment that stream into useful video segments. And when that happens, the transcoder had errors where it would output segment names that didn't actually mm -hmm. exist. And so then the playback check would alert saying, oh, I am failing to get data on this machine. Alert, alert the replication. Something in replication is broken on this box. That's not useful. It's not actually the replication system's problem. It's actually the transcoder's problem. So building smart um, domain aware alerts is really hard <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because you don't actually know the full domain. It's not all your domain. You can't know everything at the point where you're you're doing the alert. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Kyle asks, uh, when in this process of scaling your architecture, do you care about software failure detection, correctness of a system under partial network failure? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And I, I think it's very dependent on the, on the heterogeneous system that you're talking about. Um, a lot of systems exist in a single, say, cloud region. So if you're on an uh, AWS, a lot of systems exist entirely within US West 2. Network partitions within that environment uh, are significantly lower probability than if you're running a heterogeneous system across multiple data centers, um, multiple geographic locations, I should say, because US West 2 is multiple data centers, although you as a user don't really see that. Um, in the case of Twitch, uh, partial network failures were a big deal to us we could easily end up in situations where we would lose a route to a particular DC, but only from a particular perspective in the network. So for example, mm -hmm. um, we had an actual outage last year, uh, beginning of the year, where uh, services in US West 2 suddenly were unable to talk to a bare metal data center sitting uh, out on the East Coast. And so all of the liveness alerts went off. They said, oh, everything's dead. Everything's down, a big alert, emergency, emergency, emergency. And yet the system seemed to be working. Uh, like streams were, some streams were viewable, like components of the system seemed to be up. 
Uh, and it was a uh, it was a partial network partition, effectively. Um, the system was fairly resilient to it, not entirely out of luck, but partly because we had taken steps uh, to avoid particular types of network failures. For example, even though DNS isn't part of the network, um, a lot of uh, engineers think of it like it's part of the network. So uh, we we cache DNS results. I I. I uh, you know, shudder when I say that because like, a lot of people say that's horrible. <laughs> never ever do that. But it saved us so many times when DNS crashed. It's incredible. Hmm. Um, this turned out to be. I have to remember this. This turned out to be a link failure that was misdiagnosed initially as a network partition. Uh, they're actually US West 2 could actually talk to the data center we thought was disconnected. And I'm not remembering the specifics well enough. It was a very, I was actually uh, incident response manager for this. Uh, and it was complex enough that no one caught it day of. We actually recovered the situation without fully understanding the error. It took us a couple days to really understand what had happened. Um, I think it involved a border router, someone running code on the border router, some weird optical states. Like, I mean, a Twitch just went all the way down to optics because we managed the optical network that the video, we, I mean, Twitch still run, manages the optical network that the video runs on. Uh, and that's really important for latency. It's really important for quality of service and having video play smoothly. Um, but border routers are a whole beast in and of themselves in that they're really not built for automation. And the way automation happens is people write expect scripts that log in and then do things. Or worse, they cut and paste scripts mm -hmm. from text files into them. And uh, yeah, that can lead to that can lead to problems. So all right, so let's let's take the break and let's let's do the quiz. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'll put our quiz up. And uh, let's take a 10 minute break. And uh, yeah, so let's see, now it's, it's 412. So let's return at 422. Um, and I'm going to take uh, us off the stream for now, Cyrus, but we can okay. continue chit chatting uh, on Zoom for 10 minutes and then resume on the stream after that. Awesome, sounds good.
All right, welcome back. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing this and Cyrus, you can bring back your presentation. It should be back. Yep, it's back, great. Perfect. Um, and uh, can we talk about quiz results really quick, Lindsay? Absolutely, yeah. So let's see, we got uh, a hair over 70 responses to the quiz. Okay, yeah, so so it looks, so the right answer here was the multiple product features are stuffed into one API, right? That is correct. Um, yeah, so, so it looks like about, that's what about 60% of the responses said. Um, and then, yeah, then like 35% said too many distinct APIs. But that, I mean, that's maybe kind of like half what you were talking about as well, I would say. Yeah, that's um, half true. Yeah. And then there is a, a small number of responses thought it was uh, the when an API can't decide what to do. <laughs> Which is the funny, that is that is the joke. Right, answer. right. So I, I yeah, so four people, four people that. said that, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, so um, first of all, I want to make clear, this isn't a real term. Uh, this is a term uh, I made up. I don't recommend using it. Um, but uh, in general, what I was describing was the, the fact that you have uh, sort of these distinct subsets of APIs within a monolith uh, that do very different things. Um, but uh, the, second, the, the second most popular response uh, is interesting uh, because one of the problems with a, what's often called a microservice architecture where every little individual business features its own um, service and set of systems is that you do just get a heck of a lot of services and systems and that can in itself be difficult to manage. So welcome back. Uh, everyone, I, I want to go back to iteration two. Um, and I unfortunately need to tell you, this is not actually how iteration two ever looks. Um, this is like set definitely not perfect, but uh, this is way too clean for iteration two on a site. Um, what actually happens is all this engineering is happening, hopefully during a hyper growth phase because the company is doing really well and you're having operational and downtime events probably every day. They're not 50% of the site's time, but they're 50% of engineering's time, trying to figure out why they're happening and what to do about them. And the what to do about them is definitely not to fundamentally fix them because product changes are coming every day and sales is selling features that don't even exist yet. So you know they're out making million dollar contracts for a feature you need to implement in the next two months. So the lone, lone voices that are sitting in the corner that are saying, you know, guys, we should really standardize all of this and stop doing a billion different things are kindly told to shut up, basically. Uh, not in those words, but like yeah, maybe sometimes in those words. Most services are still adopting their own unique resiliency and failure strategies at this point. And the other thing to just sort of have it as context is engineers in this kind of environment burn out they leave, knowledge gaps develop. Services that used to have owners don't have owners anymore. The new adopted owners don't really understand how they work. They may not understand the resiliency mechanisms. They may not understand the failure strategies. So here's a more realistic second iteration. Um, the offline API unfortunately took down the front end at some point. So it's been removed off the load balancer and now scripts just call the offline API directly. Um, the load balancer is still used for both the front end and the admin API. The data store is slowing down. So someone threw in a write back cache. Uh, this is typically something that looks like a memcache or Redis where results or partial result, results from the data store are stored in the cache and before making a request to the data store, the front end API first checks if the write back cache has a previous result for the same query. But you know, the write back cache also is limited. So someone also threw in an in-memory cache in the API, which is basically just a smaller version of the write back cache. So what are the problems we've introduced here? And I'll I'll pause again uh, briefly and see if folks have spotted some interesting new problems. We, we certainly still have the single points of failure and the load balancer and the data store, but we also now have new problems we didn't have before.
Well, this caching here is looking a little bit suspicious. I agree. Um, caching is super sus uh, <laughs> to use to use modern lingo. <laughs> um, your keyboard broke. Uh, so Alex says greater security risks with the offline scripts now being able to directly access the offline API. Zach says caching sus. <laughs> caching is the imposter. Oh boy, yeah, I didn't mean to quite bring up that. But um, yes, often caching is the imposter in that the data in the cache uh, is actually no longer good. Um, and so you have, um, okay, we have the spoffs. Um, yes, there's the server failure thing, uh, but we have consistency issues here, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is the in memory cache consistent with the right back cache? What about the data store? What about the right back cache in the data store? Like, oh my lord, we have consistency issues all over the place. This isn't to say that caching is bad. It's not. It's an essential part of highly available systems. There's no way to get around using caches in highly mm -hmm. available systems. However, they're very difficult to get right. And they almost always cause issues when they're first introduced um, due to consistency problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you're doing caching, you're doing replication. And Basically. then you have all of the bad things that come with replication. But you're doing it by hand. <laughs> <laughs> right? So rather than taking, say, a database as the data store and mm -hmm having a bunch of replicas of it, say read replicas, and then differentiating whether you're using a read replica if you're doing something that's read or if you're going to the, the primary data store if you're doing a write, mm -hmm. um, all of which turns out to actually be quite complex to set up and manage uh, in the real world. Uh, and also typically requires a DBA, which I note are really short supply mm. in the labor market. Um, since you don't have that DBA, people throw caches at the problem instead mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and throw engineers uh, who may not have studied consistency or think of consistency. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you end up with consistency problems. Okay. Uh, let's, I'll double check here. What kind of cache is that? Um, so in general, the right back cache is going to be uh, a, um, a, a system of some sort usually a memcache or a Redis. It can be something like Dynamo, although that's less common for a cache. Um, and so these are key value stores in general. Um, they also can support, unfortunately, uh, some item, some non-item potent item, uh, operations, and that can be a trap that people fall into. The in-memory cache is likely just a set of data structures within the web server that are shared between um, threads within a particular instance. So that's the other thing to mention about the in-memory cache is that different versions of the front end process are going to have incoherent in-memory caches. Right? There isn't a in-memory cache protocol synchronizing across the different processes here. They're each going to be based on the particular requests and timings of those requests that the front end API received. There are situations in which this is perfectly OK, but then there's also a lot of situations in which this causes really interesting effects if a client makes multiple requests in a row and hits different front end API servers. There's um, another possible issue that occurs to me here. And I, I can't decide if this is worse in this picture or if it was worse in the first iteration. So um, before, we had the offline scripts talking to the load balancer. And now we don't. Yeah, And at first, this seems kind of simpler, um, that they wouldn't talk to the load balancer. But on the other hand, if they're not talking to the load balancer, then the load balancer won't have the opportunity to stop the offline scripts from taking up too much traffic to the data store. Uh, so those offline scripts, you know, if they're doing something that's not particularly essential and you have a lot of client requests to serve, then maybe you should you know, turn them off, right? Uh, and you know you can always run that report tomorrow or whatever. But in this design, there's not any. It doesn't look as though there there would necessarily be a way to handle that. Yep, and it also pushes failure detection to the scripts mm -hmm. because now if one of the offline API machines dies, um, 
that that you know that binding is at the level of the script itself that that name like what name am i talking to rather than just talking to the load balancer which is mm, probably mm -hmm, has mm -hmm. a dnsc name in front of it uh, just as a note to folks the reason this is actually very close to what happened at twitch with our monolith this was basically iteration two what's on the screen right here and the reason that there wasn't a second load balancer is that load balancer cost four hundred thousand dollars it was a piece of hardware Right, no one had four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to buy a second piece of hardware just for some offline scripts. Mm -hmm. So, um, so really, this is as much business as engineering. Right, Th these systems are in part the result of business decisions, and as engineers, it's important that we make our best estimates of risk and impact known to the business when they're asking us to modify or add things to a system. But we have to also accept that there needs to be a healthy balance between the engineering concerns, the product concerns, and the business needs. This is OK. It feels not OK, I think, when you're a new engineer in this space. This feels like I'm not being allowed to do the right thing, is how it can, how it can feel. But uh, it's not that the right thing isn't being done. It's that the right thing for the business is being done. And that isn't always the best thing from an engineering perspective. So heterogeneous system engineering is partly about finding a sense of zen about these conflicts of interest and the balance that exists between them. And I'll just say I'm still working on it. I think this is a lifelong process for anyone in this space. But it's important to not freak out the first time you experience this conflict. It's natural and it's healthy and it's okay. So where did this leave Twitch? When I joined in 2012, uh, the video system was basically a monolith with five core systems running in a single data center. And that monolith actually originated in 2009, if I remember correctly. By 2020, it was a microservice architecture of over 120 services, but each one of those services uh, was multiple systems, usually two to four systems. That's going to be a load balancer. At this point, software load balancing, hardware stuff is horrible, don't use it. Uh, an API, one or more data stores, and possibly other components. So realistically, um, there were probably 300 systems running, but many of them running in multiple regions with different configurations because they were they were replicated across multiple cloud regions and multiple bare metal regions. The original monolith finally died in April of this year. So uh, it effectively survived uh, 12 years. That's, that's an incredible amount of time. But that's normal. Monoliths take a long time to die. They become so central to everything but unwinding the dependencies is just a huge process. And adopting common patterns to things like failure detection, service frameworks, load balancing, deployment, were key to success. But the reality is that it's not there yet. There's still a lack of standards, and that still causes problems. Adopting a cloud environment like AWS or Azure can help. The services that already exist within that environment, such as the load balancers, are, are built to work together. Um, and they come with a particular philosophy. And each cloud service has a different philosophy. But you're sort of forced to adopt that philosophy. And that helps standardize, at least. Even if you don't like the philosophy, at least you're doing the same thing over and over again. That helps make things more predictable. So part three, um, some ideals and a few rules of thumb. And this is the motivational speaker part of the talk. So accept failure. Don't try again. Embrace error. If possible, be stateless. I think that's a pun on, on tasteless, but uh, yeah. yeah. Of course, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, and isolate, isolate, isolate. Um, so how one actually deals with, I'll use the word chaos, of heterogeneous systems. Uh, there are so many things to talk about. There's not enough time. But uh, I want to cover 
I want to cover things on a high level really quickly and then dig into one particular point uh, of concern. So first of all, every system and service should ideally, and I've said this a lot in this talk, address a single concern. This is so important. If a system or service gets built that addresses multiple concerns, uh, inevitably it's going to end up with more dependencies, both inbound and outbound. And that means it's gonna be all the harder to separate those concerns later. It means the failure modes are gonna be all the more complex. When you fail, you're going to affect more things. It's harder to have isolation between concerns. And this really goes together with the second item, which is you want to be loosely coupled as much as possible. If you address many concerns, really hard to be loosely coupled. Be easy to maintain. This is more than just code maintainability. This means have the semantics of the system be easy to test. If I can't test the system still works the same today as it did yesterday, I don't know if other dependencies of the system are going to uh, reject those changes or not. I don't know if they're gonna be okay with them. This means systems have to be easy to test. This is almost always missing. Be independently and repeatably deployable. I'll take two minutes on this one. What does it mean to be independently deployable? It means as a system, I can deploy changes uh, only to that system. I do not have any dependencies on deploying changes to other systems that I depend on. This is really important to make deploys easy and the second thing repeatable, which we'll get to. If I have to deploy to multiple systems to make a change to the one that I'm really targeting, I have much more complex rollout processes now. And deployment is one of those points in a system's lifecycle where failure tends to happen. Uh, I deploy new code, that code doesn't work. I deploy code to a different set of machines, and then I try switching over to it, and they're not performing as well. Maybe they have, they take more time per request, right? All sorts of things can happen here. So if we can reduce the complexity, we reduce failure. And things should be repeatably deployable. This means that if I deploy the same code, each time I deploy it, the exact same thing should happen. If I deploy the same code and I get a different result, uh, and this, by the way, is quite common early in deploy systems because configuration and deploy are intricately linked together, uh, it can be very hard to know if after deploy, I'm in a good state. So there was a period of time at Twitch where our main monolith, the standard operating procedure was to deploy twice. Because by deploying twice, you are more likely to get a good deploy the second time. And this was because of the, the interaction between how services were configured in the deployment system. Finally, have clear documentation of a system or services behavior and semantics. That way, when you move on either to a different system, to a different part of the company, to a new job entirely, uh, to retire in the mountains surrounded by nature and birds, everyone who remains has some idea of how this artifact actually works. So let's zoom in on the second one here on loose coupling and talk about a couple rules of thumb. Patrick knew this was gonna be in here. I love this one. Retries are dangerous. Um, try not to do them. Why are retries dangerous? Now, I want to just preface, this is within the context of heterogeneous systems. So we're not talking about um, a distributed system, uh, you know, a first order distributed system that has a very uh, particular purpose. We're talking about a heterogeneous collection of systems here. So what happens? Um, the, the gray arrows are our request path here. So the APL. And the, um, sorry, I took out the load balancers. I just drew them as queues. Basically, a load balancer can be thought of as a queue of requests. Um, if there's enough capacity, the queue might be empty. But if there's not enough capacity in the back end, requests start to back up uh, in the queue. So the API makes a request to the load balancer. Um, and at that point, the API doesn't really know what happens. Maybe the load balancer forwarded it, hopefully. Maybe the data store responded, maybe it didn't, 
But what we do know is we get an error back. So this red dashed arrow, we're getting an error response. So the first thing a lot of engineers do is they retry. And they get an error, and they retry again. So what's, what's happening as we do this? We don't know. We could just be banging our head against the load balancer, which might be in a bad configuration. Maybe it's overloaded. Maybe the queue is full. Or we could be putting more load on the data store. If the data store isn't responding because it's overloaded, putting more load on it is not going to resolve that problem. If the data store uh, is close to failure and we put more load on the data store, the data store will fail. And now we're really in trouble, right? So I think the first thing to understand of retries in a heterogeneous system is from our vantage point, we don't actually know what those retries are going to do necessarily. And if we're retrying after an error, they're likely going to make a bad situation worse. Let's also talk about item potency for a second. Um, so now, rather than just data store, that, that, uh, that database looking thing now says memcached. Memcached is a particular key value store. And it conveniently has this operator called inker. And inker does exactly what you'd expect. It increments the value of a named variable within memcache. So in this case, let's say we have a variable x, and it equals 0. And then someone issues an API request, and that request gets translated into a memcache command, inker x1. So this means increment the value of x by 1. Awesome. We uh, issue the command to the load balancer, and we get an error. So what has happened? Well, we don't really know, but you know, heck, let's, oh, OK. For sake of argument, let's say what happened is that memcache incremented the value, returned something to the load balancer, but something went wrong in that interface, and we get an error back. Well, let's retry. Inker x1, error. Inker x1, error. So now we've incremented the value to 3. We intended the value to be 1. Um, so like our conceptualization of what the value is supposed to be and what it actually is is completely inconsistent at this point. Uh, we've put more load on memcache. We haven't diagnosed the problem. And we certainly haven't done what the request to the API was telling us to do. Let's talk about Patrick's credit card example. This is an example that Patrick uh, posed to me about a month ago. A system takes an order, a credit card number, and generates an order record. The requesting client is the web front end that's going to display the result to the user once the, the credit card is charged. Upon trying the third-party credit processor, the system receives an error message. Should we retry? Let's take a 30-second. Um, poll in chat. Uh, great question. Let's see. The question is, do I reveal Patrick's answer? <laughs> I, rather than uh, bothering to try to do a Zoom poll, especially oh. since a lot of people aren't on Zoom, oh, yeah, let's just. Let's just see what um, what folks say uh, on Zulip. So, yeah. so we got a no. We've got uh, a no, from Raphael. I'll give it fifteen more seconds. Well, you did just say that retries are evil. I did. This is true. Kyle says, "Eh." <laughs> <laughs> um. Something, something, everything is a trade-off. That's true. If it's base house. So no, OK. So should we retry? Um, well, the actual answer is depends. Uh, trick question. Uh, but probably no. Yeah, the, it, probably no. If unless the credit card processor you know, has really convinced us that we will never receive an error uh, and the charge, uh, the, the card was charged. If they can't convince us of that, no, heck no, we should not retry. We really don't want to double charge the customer. We'd much rather we just give them an error and say, hey, try again, right? Didn't go through. Um, yeah. 
So uh, next, try to make stateless requests. And this is sort of what we just covered with the item potency here, right? Uh, it's hard not to retry if a transaction is completed in multiple parts. We may have partially completed something. We may be in a, in a, in a state that we don't want to just leave there or that would leave um, some sort of state crumbs. Um, try not to do this. Try not to make non-item potent requests. Um, so for the memcache example, do store the new value. Don't increment the value. Now, what does this imply? It implies we have to get the value first. So we have to do a get request, get the value, increment it in the process, and then do a store. This is more costly, but that cost is worth it from a semantics standpoint and a consistency standpoint. If you need transactional semantics, uh, if you can't avoid them, use a proven service that provides them for you. Don't try to create them in your own services. Um, propagate errors early. What does this mean? It means if I get an error, rather than retrying, just return it to the requester. And in fact, return it all the way up the stack to the very original requester. Make the error their problem. Why their problem? Well, the error lets us know the system is struggling, right? Might be close to failure, could be something wrong. But the request may not even be important anymore. The user may have loaded the page. They may not care about our particular service. The request might not be timely anymore. Maybe if we answered it now, it just doesn't matter anyway. Let the original requester figure out if they care. A lot of product managers don't like this, but uh, it's something to have a, a long and multiple discussions with your product managers about. And then finally, and I know I'm rushing because I know we're, we're low on time. Um, Early error return goes even better if active load control. And there's multiple versions of this. I'm going to talk about one where not only do we have a load balancer, but our local process instance also has a request queue, an outbound request queue. And as requests come in, this queue might start to fill up. This is indicating that the data store is probably getting busy because requests are taking more time. If a request comes in and that queue is full, don't even try to process it. Return an error immediately. That feels bad because maybe if we queued it, we'd get to it. Maybe it would all work. Like, shouldn't we try? But the problem of trying here is we're just adding more pressure, more load to the systems that we depend on. We'd rather back off, hopefully let them recover, the queue starts to go down, and then we can put another request in. If most systems do this, it's unlikely the service is ever going to collapse. We might have some errors. There might be some page error loads. Maybe some uh, transactions don't complete. But we're available generally to our users. Retries can be a necessary evil. If you have to do them, use back off. Um, however, Understand that if you're doing back off, this implies a rapid buildup of request state in your system. That has memory implications. I've seen systems out of memory because they were using retries. There's a major user rush. Their uh, backend goes down. They're retrying. They run out of memory. Uh, I'm just going to skip that one because we're out of time, I believe. Um, and go to the conclusion. Uh, complex business processes and life cycles lead to these really complex heterogeneous systems. Holding back the business isn't the right trade-off. Instead, we need to use tools like isolation and loose coupling and a lot of other techniques to help lower risk and impact when failure does occur. And failure will occur, and that's OK. That's expected. If your business leaders are telling you don't make things better and then they get really upset when there's failure, that's a discussion that the VP of engineering or CTO needs to have with the business leader. So engineering is as much a social process as it is a heads down process in designing code. And with that, uh, thank you very much. There's my email if you want to email me. If you're interested in interns in this space, internships in this space, it's uh, unfortunately too late for the summer, but in the future, 
feel free to email, and I can certainly reach out and connect you with people uh, within uh, Twitch and AWS. All right, Cyrus, thanks so much for this wonderful talk. It really brought together a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about all quarter in a sometimes much uh, a much more abstract context, and it made them very concrete and visceral. So thank you. Um, let me also point out that we have a lot of graduating students, so some of them are going to be looking for not just uh, not just internships but full time mm -hmm. positions. So. Uh, Thank you Let very much for yeah. Thank you for volunteering uh, to to talk to folks about that. And I would urge all of you to take Cyrus up on the offer. Yeah, you have my email. Uh, I conveniently have a fair amount of time right now, so feel free to email me. Uh, you know, whether it's about opportunities uh, or if it's just if you have more questions uh, about uh, the lecture, be happy to talk. What was that slide that we skipped over? Was that ah, uh... that was? Oh, that's those are my backup slides. Um, huh. rate, rate limiting. limiting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a great one. Um, yeah. So every service or system has some sort of sustainable load peak, right? Like if you think about a, a specific configuration of a system, you have X number of instances of the service running. Uh, and you have a particular mixture of requests that are flowing into that service. Those mixtures tend to be fairly standard. With those two pieces of information, you can calculate your peak sustainable load before you start to see service degre degradation. Um, awesome. Do that, and then have a rate limiter that only allows x percent of that peak sustainable load into production at any given time. You know, something like 95, 98% of that peak sustainable load. This is a way that doesn't involve the actual uh, handling process, having to think about its state um, to easily make sure that a fleet of API servers is going to remain up during a load spike that would overwhelm peak sustainable load. Right? You just let your rate limiter, which is usually your load balancer, um, deal with it for you and just shed that load early. Shedding load is OK, right? Those users will hit reload. So what you're really doing is you're not getting rid of the load. You're smoothing it out at a sustainable maximum peak, where if you tried to take that load, your performance would start to degrade very rapidly. That, that you know degradation uh, becomes nonlinear uh, almost immediately. And then you collapse. And now no one's on the website. So You'd rather reject, cap off, smooth, and and stay available. Um, and rate limiting is a great way to do that. Um, yeah. So these two techniques go together really well. I'd recommend both because they sort of solve different problems. Um, this. You know, active load control on your dependencies is really looking at, is your dependency healthy? Rate limiting for your service is really trying to make sure your service is healthy. So they're, they're addressing two different things in my mind. They are related in that uh, if you're taking on too much load, your dependency might be taking on too much load. But uh, they're best in combination with each other. All right. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. So in an effort to rate limit the flow of information into everyone's brains, I, I think we're going to end the broadcast here. But thanks. And uh, so I'll see you Thursday.